Lola Rosers translates novels, short stories, poems, comics and children's literature from Finnish into English. Her most recent translation is the internationally acclaimed novel Summer Fishing in Lapland by Yohani Karia. Lola's translations have been shortlisted for the Oxford Wiedenfeld Translation Prize and the Petrona Award for Nordic Crime Fiction. Her translation of Johanna Sinisalo's The Core of the Sun won the 2017 Prometheus Award. She was named an NEA Translation Fellow for her translation of The Death of Orvar Klein, a Finnish modern classic by Daniel Katz. Lola has served as a translation mentor through Finnish Literature Exchange and is a founding member of the Finnish English Literary Translation Cooperative. In this conversation she spoke about how she started translating Finnish literature, Finnish translator community and about the author Rosa Lexum and the novel The Colonel's Wife. The Colonel's Wife can be purchased using the link given in the show notes. Welcome to our podcast. Nice to have you with us today. Thank you. Nice of you to invite me. Now, how did you get into translation of Finnish literature? I studied Spanish when I was uh, in school for several years and I used to translate poetry from Spanish at that time and then I actually had a good friend in high school who was from Finland. and she got me interested in finnish language because it was just so much more distinct and different from english than spanish was i realized that finnish was an actual foreign language in a way that spanish hadn't been and that i was very curious about the grammar i often tell the story about asking her how do you say coffee in finnish and she replied that depends what you want to say about it which was didn't make any sense to me at the time because i had no concept of those kinds of that kind of morphological changes with case endings and so on and so i was always curious about it and when i went back after several years to university and majored in linguistics then i studied finnish language as a part of my linguistic studies and we were only required to study finnish or some language outside of our own language family for one year but i couldn't stop studying Finnish and I'm still studying Finnish now because it's a endless process of learning and I'm learning what's happening now in the language as well. Finnish uh, does it have different variants uh, within Finland? Oh yeah. Yeah, there's a a lot of distinct uh dialects uh that are all mutually intelligible for the most part. So yeah, there are I ha- don't have any trouble understanding people it, unless they speak very quickly <laughs> which is funny because the well, some of the quickest speakers are Hel- Helsinki people and of course that's where I spend all my time when I'm there so you have to really be on your toes to understand some of the Hel- Hel- Helsinki speakers of Finnish yeah city people have the habit of making people confused <laughs> <laughs> so in translation uh, one of the other main part is to understand uh, the cultural nuances right so what kind of effort uh, did you put into understanding finnish culture and people once you started translating i started translating after i had been a student in helsinki i studied at helsinki university as a visiting student for a year and i came home with a bunch of cd's of my favorite music that i'd heard there it was a wonderful time in the 1990s for all these great bands and so i would translate the lyrics of of my favorite pop songs for friends that that's how i got started in translation and became immersed in the culture there when i was living there and then i went back i've been back to finland for a couple of summer school courses over the years and for seminars conferences and i was an intern at feely literature finnish literature exchange which they do every year they have a translator intern in their offices every year and as that part of that process you meet all kinds of authors and publishers and which is a wonderful opportunity that they provide and of course i keep in touch with friends and old colleagues in finland as well so in the city where you went to school in usa you had any finnish community living there other than friends that you mentioned 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's there's an act, really active Finnish American community here in Seattle. They have the Finnish Lutheran Church, which is conducted, they conduct the services regularly in Finnish as well as English. And there's fin- Finlandia Foundation and fin- Finnish clubs and organizations. There's a Christmas bazaar every year with all kinds of Finnish foods and handicrafts. So yeah, I do, I do get to know Finnish people here in Seattle as well. Now, please talk about uh, contemporary Finnish literature, themes, some important writers, etc. There's a long tradition of realism in Finnish literature, as there is in other Nordic literatures, and that includes contemporary writers as well. Sofie Oksanen is a well-known writer of realist literature with social messages and messages about history. In particular, there's a lot of historical fiction happening in Finland. There's been a big movement recently within the last 10 years or so, to write about Finland's experience of World War II in particular. Sophie Oksen has written about that, and Rosa Liksom. And there is also very, very Finnish-focused historical literature that's just a marvelous stuff. Sirpa Kähkinen is a historical novelist who writes really beautifully. She just won the Finlandia Prize this year. But there's also a lot of newer things happening with more experimental and surrealist and stream of consciousness writing authors like Miki Liukonen and Paitin Statokchi, who has written the surrealist novels that have been really widely translated and was even nominated for a National Book Award for one of his novels uh, that was translated into English, which is very unusual for a Finnish book to get that kind of recognition abroad and especially in English. And yeah, it was his book, Crossing, translated by David Haxton, that was nominated for a National Book Award. But then there's also an area of literature that is often referred to as Finnish weird, which is can include speculative fiction, science fiction, magic realism, uh, surrealism. And there's a, a lot of really great writers doing that as well. And I translated some of their work, uh, Johannes Sinisalo and Pasi Askelainen and Juhani Karila, whose book I've just come out with uh, this past year in trans- English translation. And uh, there's a lot of humor in Finnish literature, which has always been the case from the very beginning of Finnish literature. The oldest classic novels have a lot of humor in them. And uh, so do s- these genre authors that I was talking about, these Finnish weird, quote unquote, authors, as well as like crime novels. Ati Tuomainen started writing crime novels in a very, it's a wonderfully written sort of noir, noir novels early in his career, but now he's moved to writing these humorous crime novels that are just delightful and uh, have been huge uh, bestsellers in, in English as well. So those are some of the changes. Also more immigrant writers in contemporary Finnish literature than in the past, including Patin Stakovci, whom I mentioned. And then there's also more nonfiction coming available in translation than there used to be. And I think that's partly because of interest in the geopolitical situation in Finland right now. Elsewhere in the world, there's a a sudden new interest in Finland's relationship with Russia. There's a book uh, called Putin's Trolls, written by a journalist dealing with the information war. Um, People have experienced, especially in the countries bordering Russia, and and also, there's a book out that's just come out this past year, How Finland Survived Stalin by Kim Rentola, that's translated by Richard Robinson. And yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of nonfiction coming out in translation. There's always tons of nonfiction published in Finland, but it's new for this many books to be translated into other languages. So that's nice. So all this for 5 million people speaking Finnish. Yeah, they, they punch above their weight. <laughs> as we say <laughs> yeah 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 so it must be a great uh, book reading culture it is it's very very literate culture uh, i believe i don't know if it's always true but many years finland has the most library use per capita people get books out from the library read a lot of books every year tons of books published every year yeah it's very important to Finns, literature as like the yeah. How is the publishing industry doing in general? Many publishers. 
yeah, there's the publishing industry is holding steady. At least there are new publishers, new small publishers appear and, and then you don't hear from them, but there's always this ongoing, yeah, it's a very dynamic book culture. I'd say there's several really large publishing houses, not, I don't know, not large by international standards, but the larger finished publishing houses that have been in business for a hundred years. And then there are little publishers coming up every so often as well. Yeah. No, I don't know that there is any correlation between literature, uh, thriving literature and quality of life. But uh, Finland is ranked number three in the world in quality of life. Yeah, they have a really great social safety net there. It makes it easy to not worry about where you'll be when you're old or what you'll do if you lose your job or break your leg. That's not nearly as difficult there as it is even in the United States, let alone other places. Now, how are the translations from Finnish to English? Number of translators, translators community as such. There are, I looked it up because I knew I was going to talk to you. There are six, there are basically six working translators in Finnish who have translated more than two book links works in the past five years. So it's a small group of people. And and then there's other people who will occasionally translate something, more like a dozen people in the world who have been translating over the past 10 years and have maybe done one or two books over that period of time. So it's a difficult way to make a living, although it used to be that there were there was more demand at the time Finland was invited to be the theme country at Frankfurt Book Fair that was in 2014. And in the, that was actually just four years after I began translating professionally. And so for four years, the number of the amount of work that I was offered was really just kept going up and up. I was busy all the time. There was a shortage of translators in Finland. The Feely Finnish Literature Exchange was, was working hard to tra- to train translators. But then after Frankfurt, inevitably, the demand for Finnish books and translation fell. But now we have lots more translators who work at least occasionally. And so there's, so it's harder to make a living as a translator than it used to be. But the translation community, including the people who work, make their living as translators and also uh, people who translate occasionally, is a wonderful community with a lot of sharing of information and resources. We've done some group projects together over the years. We put together a Finnish issue of Words Without Borders back when they had a monthly issues, which they don't now that it's an ongoing project. But at that time, they, we had a monthly issue d- dedicated to Finland, and I was able to write to translators all over the world and ask them if they had any suggestions or if they'd like to participate. And we had a large group of people who participated, which was really fun. But the thing that's great about Finnish literature is that because of Feely and the Finnish support for translators, I've met people who translate from Finnish into all different languages, people from all over the world at the seminars and conferences that Feely provides. So I have all these old colleagues who are translators from Finnish into different languages. And it's really great because they have online social media forum for translators. And if you're translating a book, you can just go on there and talk to other translators who have already translated or are in the process of translating that same book and discuss it with them. And it's one of the most helpful things that you'll ever get to actually have someone working on the very same book. And sometimes they've already talked with the author. They may have sent the author dozens of questions and they'll be able to answer any questions you have with it. You won't have every translator sending dozens of questions to the author, which is takes the burden off of them, which I did with my recent translation. It I, was really helpful translating Fishing for the Little Pike. And I remember after I finally had a, a draft and I had discussed it with my fellow translators of the same book, Yuhani Karila, the author, is like, oh, uh, yes, how did you know about that, that I wanted that changed? And I said, oh, I talked with Sebastian Musilak. He told me that you said you wanted to change this part and things like that. So it's really, they're great. Uh, it's really great to have such a supportive community. Yeah, we need help too. We've had work alone all the time. 
<laughs> yeah, artists are lucky. Yeah, even translators too for that matter. Since you started translating, uh, what are the changes uh, have you witnessed in translations from Finnish to English? There's definitely a lot more translators now, and there are several of us who have managed to really translate a lot, which I think is I and David and until recently Owen Weitzman, Christian London, and now there's Mia Spangenberg also, who also Emily and Fleur Jeremiah to a great extent, people who are able to translate really often because it takes a lot of time to get good at translating from Finnish into English and doing working on it just occasionally every couple of years or whatever, it, it's difficult to become really good at it, in my opinion, even if you're a bilingual speaker of the language. I don't think it even matters really, as long as you have a basic mastery of the language, whether you're a bilingual speaker or whether it's a, a language you learned later in life. Translating is a skill uh, of as that goes much beyond that. So now there are a lot of really good translators, which wasn't the case when I began. There was a, hardly any translators, and a lot of them had just a little bit of experience translating because they'd just done one or two books over many years. So now there's a lot of people who've done a dozen, two dozen. They've translated lots and lots of different styles of writing and lots of writers. And that makes a big difference in the quality of the books. Yeah, do you do any mentoring? Ooh, I do. I've mentored four Feely Finnish Literature Exchange. I've done, I've had three mentees, done it over a period of five or six years. And yeah, and Mia in particular, she happened to be one of the mentees. And because we both live in Seattle, I was assigned as her mentor. And she's still working as a professional translator. She's had her first couple of books. Her first fictional work came out just this past year. Book of uh, Red Book of Farewell by Pirko Saizio, who is a great Finnish novelist and memoirist, has just come out. She's succeeding. So broadly, what are your directives uh, to your mentees? What do, you, what do you mentor about? I largely respond to what they feel their needs are and just answer questions and provide feedback. But I do have, I actually have a list of things to know. It's basically things I wish I'd known when I began translating from Finnish. That's, there are so many things that are really specific to Finnish language in particular. The structure of the language is just so different than English that there are these regular conundrums that you come up against them again and again translating. You're like, oh, here is that thing again. How do, <laughs> how can I translate this? And one of the things you have to learn, especially if, like me, and like a lot of Finnish uh, to English translators, you may have begun translating some other language that's more similar. So I worked from Spanish at one time, for example. And you forget that you can change uh, the grammar. You do not have to, it's impossible as to to use this similar grammar in English because the grammars are so different. And so you can completely rearrange everything and you have to get away from the words and to the level of the meaning and the imagery and the tone and everything. So in Finnish, and in Finnish, for example, there's a lot of passive constructions. People, people don't do things are done. And so you have to remember, no, in English, we use a subject in a sentence like that. And we, if anything, it's just a, yeah, things like that. So I have a big list of things like that to share with myself and with Nifty's. We recently had the American Literary Translators Association conference in Tucson just a couple of months ago. And one of the panels that we gathered was about translating from more foreign languages, quote unquote. Because so many times uh, when you attend some discussion of translation, I've heard translators from, say, romance languages or whatever, discussing whether it's ethical to change the word order of a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> or to change the punctuation. And for someone who translates from Finnish or Telugu or Tamil or Korean or uh, Uzbek, we had all kinds of people there. They're like, that, that's crazy talk. You have to change those things. Or it won't make any sense. And so we did have this discussion specifically for people who work from languages where they're just not like English. And it was great. It was a really fun discussion. Please tell us about the translation 
which you had to drop as it was not satisfactory to you is there any book like that in between you stop translating it you didn't feel like translating it yeah i basically i have the ability to say no so that's when people cuz i don't choose what i translate i'm normally just There are there is one big exception of a book I translated because I really wanted to and I'm looking for a publisher for that but normally I've been just approached by a publisher and asked to translate something and so the I do choose my work to the extent that I say no if I don't want to translate something just recently I was approached about a, a project and I was like oh that sounds intriguing and then I started looking at it and I was like no I don't think I would enjoy this they just wrote back and said I don't think this is something that I I want to work on please contact me if you have something else And I have the experience a lot where this happens to me a lot where I'm asked to translate a sample chapter. I do that's about half of the work I do is working for agencies and publishers to just write a sample translation for them to market the book abroad to basically anyone because so many people can read English. And it often happens that I get very excited about a book based on the having read and translated the first two or three or four chapters. And so I read the rest of the book and I'm like, "Oh, doesn't really end well or it doesn't there's something about the book that I think I don't think this would work in English for whatever reason which is too bad it's always disappointing but that happens that's happened several times over over the time I've been translating once I've agreed to translate a book and I'm working on it I become I definitely become aware of its flaws but I also become aware of its beauties and all the wonderful clever things that the author has done sometimes things the author the author, authors themselves don't even think about I, i'll remark on how this there's this real echo this word that keeps occurring and it's really beautiful and they're like oh is there oh that's nice <laughs> they're not even aware of it and so by the time i have decided to translate a book and translated it i have read it so many times and i just love it i become more and more appreciative the more i learn what the author has done to create the book what is your workflow like when you take up a, a book for translation normally i try to read ahead a little bit i often don't have time to read the whole book i know a lot of translators say you must do that but i often don't have time especially when i'm doing samples but sometimes when i'm doing full length books as well yeah but i begin by reading a bit and then i translate I tend to translate a rough draft but it's not as rough as some people. So I do try to get everything translated. I don't want to leave anything still in finish, although sometimes I think that's foolish of me, but in any case I do that and for instance, if it's a if it's a book length translation, I'll probably do three or four chapters before i then print them out on paper read them aloud to myself and mark changes that i want to make and that will be i'll do that set them aside for a while before i do that and so i forget what i had in mind and can just read it fresh as an english language text so i do that print it out read it aloud mark it up make changes and then i print it again and give it to my husband who is my proofreader <laughs> my patient husband and he all he does is just say i don't understand this part or i think you misspelled this he doesn't critique the style just like he just approaches it as a reader is this understandable do i know what she means here or is it like that and that's really helpful it's just basically the reader's point of view the average reader on the street he doesn't speak finnish and uh, so yeah and then i do another revision and usually set that aside for a while and yeah almost always set that aside for a uh, quite a while come back to it at the end of the project then i read the whole thing again and make another round of changes yeah uh no you said uh, you read it aloud right yes always i know some people don't and i think yes you got to read it aloud if you don't read it aloud first of all you'll miss errors if you don't read it aloud But secondly, you won't know what it really sounds like unless you read it aloud. You could find things that are great. They seem great, 
then you read them aloud and you realize, oh my goodness, every sentence, every word in this sentence begins with an S. What was I thinking? <laughs> Things like that. So yeah, it really helps to read it aloud. And it also helps to read the original aloud and compare the rhythm of the two and say, just keep in mind that Yes, you want to create a beautiful thing or a whatever kind of thing, some an ugly thing, whatever the book wants to be in English, but to keep going back to the original to make sure you're still tied to what the author intended originally. How do you evaluate the translation? See, I am a really strong believer that in in particular from less known languages, you evaluate the translation based on how it reads as an English text. You evaluate it exactly as you would a book that was originally written in English. And the reason I say that is because there's this, this is another thing that, <laughs> that you hear is you shouldn't review or evaluate a book if you can't translation, if you can't speak the original language. And for me, that's, that means I will never have any of my works reviewed because nobody else speaks, no book reviewers speak Finnish. So that is not useful. And it, it doesn't make any sense. It seems like, <sighs> It's, it just seems like a crazy thing to say, <laughs> because the way I think about it, I think that translating is, in a way, it's a kind of performance art. At least it can be compared to performance art. For example, if you watch a, you don't, film reviewers don't read the script of a film before they write their review. They don't feel like, I need to know what the screenwriter had in mind before I decide whether I think this is well acted or well directed. That doesn't make any sense. You judge the film on what before you, and I think that translations should be treated the same way. Now, you said the uh, Finnish government supports translations. Uh, what kind of support does it uh, give to translators? just a ton of stuff. It's so crazy how lucky translators from Finnish are. We, I attended, I became, I was an intern there and was able to, as a part of the internship, basically I was an office assistant. <clears throat> but as part of the internship, I met all these, I would I attended all these publishers and editors events. I had translator seminars. I, by the time I left, thinking that I would work as I had already been certified to work as an English teacher. I plan to do that and translate in my spare time. But every all these agents and publishers who'd met me just sw swarmed <laughs> with uh, their requests for sample translations in particular. So I had no time to do anything but translate. So this was a fantastic opportunity for me that they provided. And then since then, they've provided, I've been to numerous seminars and conferences they've put together. They provide travel grants for translators so that you can return to Finland. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to keep in touch with Finland the way I have been if it weren't for the assistance of Feely Finnish Literature Exchange. So it's wonderful. They also used to have Books from Finland magazine, who run by Saila Lehtonen, a wonderful editor there. And my first published translations of prose were in books from Finland magazine, which was a great opportunity as well. So this is, there's just tons of stuff they do. I probably have missed some of the most important things they do. Any do's and don'ts for uh, budding translators uh, when they pitch their work to publishers? Unfortunately, I am not an expert on this. My attitude is don't because it's hopeless. <laughs> Some people have succeeded. I just don't, it's really hard when you try, are trying to make a living to do all the work that's necessary to pitch. There's, you don't get paid for that. It seems to me like pitching the publishers is a luxury for people who have more money than I do. I just don't have time, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm doing it now. I have a, <laughs> so I'm really contradicting myself, contradicting myself, but I got an NEA grant to translate, um, a really wonderful, um, really funny, delightful book uh, by Daniel Katz. He's a Jewish Finnish author and um, has been publishing in Finland for decades. And anyway, so I got a grant to translate this book by him called The Death of Orpha Klein. It's really funny and really smart and interesting book. And so now I'm trying to pitch that to publishers. I've sent it around to a bunch of publishers. Most of them didn't even reply to Whatever the projects that you have done so far, you are involved in. These are all commissioned, right? 
So, publisher comes to you. Yeah, yeah, so far. Exactly. Yeah, at least that's, that has been my, that used to be my experience and still is, but there's less work. But, but actually, I think that may be temporary as well, because I have been asked to do more things in the last couple of years again. And so that's nice. Now, what are the projects that you're currently working on? I have, as I said, I'm trying to market that Daniel Katz book. And I also I just did a translation, translated a novel by Yuhani Karila that came out this past year, Fishing for the Little Pike. And now I've been working with him to translate some of his short stories for journals. That's an example where I think, where I was actually contacted by a journalist like, hey, we really love this novel. Do you have any short stories? And I'm like, no, I better do that. <laughs> working on some short stories with him, which is really fun. and. Yeah. And doing more samples. I have a new sample I've just, just done for Posse Askelinen's newest novel. And he, I've translated a couple of his novels into English and he's really weird and wonderful writer. So hoping that will find a publisher in English. It'll no doubt find a publisher in many languages, but I hope English is one of them. And yeah, that's what I've been working on. I do a lot of samples, which is great. It means I get to read tons of author's work and not just read it, but actually work on translating it and know whether it's, whether it's something I could do well. One of the first books that you translated from Finnish is Spatch. Please tell us uh, how you have come across this book and uh, the journey till it got published. That was actually the first, my first book length translation and it was like a really lucky thing for me. I, I had a I took a workshop from Tina Nunnally, who's a translator, a very highly respected translator from Scandinavian languages in university. I took a work translation workshop from her, and then she became my, my thesis advisor for my master's degree. And she just basically helped me out in all kinds of ways and has many times over the years. And she, she worked regularly for an agency that had taken Sophie Oxenden onto their list of authors, and it was their first Finnish author. So they asked her to recommend a Finnish translator, and she recommended me. And so I was really lucky, did a sample for them that went on to just sell massively to really quickly to a bunch of different countries. And when an English language publisher bought the rights to it, they asked to hire the person who had written this sample translation. So I was really lucky. I was really lucky to have that be my first project. It, yeah. The book, uh, The Colonel's Wife. Uh, Rosa Lixam, the author. Please uh, talk about her as an author. She's a really interesting author. She, for a long time, wrote uh, short stories, and that's what she was best known for. She got started writing in the in the late eighties and early nineties, and she's a real Renaissance woman and kind of a countercultural Finland figure in Finland. She she does so she wrote short stories for years. She writes in dialect. She often writes about uh, represented people in the culture, uh, and working class people and people who living really at the edge in many ways and a really delightful different styles of, of language where each story had its own really great unique voice and she also does visual art and photography and she's done some experimental filmmaking so she's just wonderful she's delightful to talk to as well and her first novel was compartment number six and that was the first novel she wrote which was in the two th oh, in the 2000s and then the Colonel's Wife is her second novel, and it's a historical novel set in what we call World War II. In Finland, it's really referred to as three different wars. In Finland, there was basically three phases, three wars. There was the Winter War, which was when Russia invaded Finland, and Finland fought them off and repelled the invasion, which was is still to this day a source of tremendous pride in Finland because they were really outmatched, but they managed to fend off that invasion. And then later the, the Russians attacked again. And at that point, Finland allowed German troops to 
enter Finland and fight the Russians alongside the Finns to expel this invasion. And they lost. And after the continuation war was lost, Finland lost a good deal of their territory. Hundreds of thousands of refugees had to flee to Finland, to what was now Finland from what used to be part of Finland. It was a really horrible and traumatic experience for them. And then after they lost, Germany refused to leave. And so they had the Finns had to expel the Germans from Lapland in what is called the Lapland War. So the book is set in the lead up. It's about a, a girl, a little girl growing up in a far right family. And as a teenager, she becomes a fervent Nazi and she marries the colonel who is also a Nazi sympathizer who has uh, taken his military training in Germany and is very excited about having Finland be expel the Russians and become a nationalist state. And she shares his enthusiasm. And basically the course of her life very closely follows that of an actual person who Rosa Lixam was very fascinated by a woman who was a local celebrity where where Rosa Lixam grew up in Lapland, who was indeed married to a military officer and participated as a sort of a office assistant in war crimes of the time of prisoner mistreatment and really horrible goings on. And she she later, after the war, became like a popular children's author and, and an environmentalist campaigning to preserve the natural environment of Lapland. And she's a really fascinating person. And that's why Rosie Lixon wrote this novel based on her life. And the novel also follows the course of her life. First of all, the events very closely, but it has its own metaphorical level where, whereby her personal uh, relationships her personal relationship with the colonel follows the arc of the war, the enthusiasm for nationalism at the beginning, and then the terrible defeat. Uh, and because uh, her husband um, becomes very uh, abusive, her marriage becomes miserable uh, at the same time that the, the country of Finland is being destroyed by external forces as well. So it's really, it's a, it's an interesting arc that the two, the life and the life of the country go hand in the story. So were there any areas where you had to get help and where you had to spend a lot of time in translating? The most I had to do in terms of spending a lot of time was just doing historical research, just looking things up to make sure I understood the what what the situation was in real life, reality, what the l- historical facts were, because it's a, a, in terms of the larger historical facts, the book is very accurate. But it, of course, invents conversations and invents gatherings of people that may or may not have ever had a breakfast together at a certain place at a certain time, things like that. But I was a little concerned when I began that the dialect might be hard to translate because it's the whole thing is written in dialect and it's written phonetically in dialect in a way that's not often done in English anymore. But it turned out to be quite easy to read. I didn't have any problem with that. It's really fun to read. But it's hard to create the feeling of dialect without using a dialect that's completely inappropriate to the context, whatever dialects I'm familiar with are not what you can use in a translation that's meant to be set in a very specific place and time. So I had to create or invent what I call a dialect from nowhere. And of course, that's really highly standardized, the the language. It was much more standard English than the original with standard Finnish, which was a disappointment, of course. But it's in my conversations with other translators who worked on the novel. Of course, we all came to that same Uh, solution for writing the novel. Otherwise, you'll get something that would be more of an adaptation. What if this story took place someplace entirely different, where they speak completely differently? And you can't really do that. You have to have a a language that doesn't call attention to itself in in the translation of this kind. Anyway, uh, yeah, so it was standardized. And then in the editing process, got further standardized. I've talked before about 
there's a tendency to allow, there may be in some, for some publishers, a tendency to allow any kind of language at all that an author wants to use who's writing originally in English. But if it's a translation, then there's this fear that any deviation from standard English will be read as an error of translation. I'm not sure what they think it will be. But yeah, it's difficult because it leaves out any kind of dialectical voices in translation. Um, or yeah, she's meant to be someone who speaks heavy dialect and is also a well-known author. And I don't see that as any problem, That's <laughs> as any contradiction. But so many people in publishing often Maybe they speak standard English as their actual home dialect. I don't think so, but maybe they do. It's very unusual to speak the kind of language you read in books at home, but maybe lots, maybe there's lots of people who do. Anyway, I didn't grow up doing that. <laughs> so it doesn't strike me as odd to have that kind of voice, but in any case, so it become, becomes a bit more standardized after it goes through the hands of a translator and then an editor and then a copy editor. But yeah, it still has some, some funky language in there, I hope, that gives it some flavor. In one of the interviews that you have given about this book, uh, I read that uh, main character is the one who wrote her own story and uh, she is not good at proper syntax and grammar and you had some difficulty. Yeah, yeah, she's, she speaks quote-unquote wrong Finnish, just as we speak wrong English all the time when we're talking casually among friends and so on. And she's telling the setting, the sort of framing story you are. The idea is that you're actually at her house and she's telling you the story of her life. So she's speaking the way she would speak in her own home. And yeah, so there were little things like some things that were retained in my translation, a very common change between formal and vernacular English is that it's more common in vernacular English to use the so-called object form as the subject of a sentence. Me and Tom are going to go to the store. Do you need anything? Right. So we're using me as the subject there. It's extremely common. Lots and lots of people do it. Of People of all backgrounds do that when they're talking. and But I had to talk them into allowing me to do that in this. Even though it's just teeny tiny non-standard form uh, in a book that's teeming with them, which I wasn't, all these things I wasn't able to use because I couldn't find equivalent. But I found some things that I could do. and But I really had to talk the publishers into allowing it, which is strange to me. I really do think you, yeah, there's a real... I think there's a real unawareness of the class issues or just the, I don't know what it is, surrounding dialect. It's strange. It's, it doesn't occur to you that there would be more interesting and diverse voices if we had these kinds of different ways of writing that weren't so-called standard. Not to mention among different languages, in, like in India, to have things translated would be nice. Yeah. Now, before we end, uh, please read a paragraph or two from Colonel's wife in both uh, Finnish and in English. So this is a this is a scene when the lead in we lead up just before the war is about to begin, and uh, the Colonel's wife is working in a border station as a, like a bookkeeper and receptionist in the border station. Uh, I'll read a little bit in. Finish and then and then I'll read a bit in English. I should I should say before I begin that I can read this dialect very well, but I don't really feel confident of pronouncing it, so I just read it as if it were standard Finnish. So, yeah, as well as I can. Mie kuntelin raatiota ja hoksasin, että siellä alehtiin soittamaan sitä enempi saksalaisia sotalaismarsia, mitä lähemmäksi sota käytiin. Ensin viritettiin päivästä toisen aina vain syvempää epäluuloa ja vihaa rissiä kohtaan. Haukuttiin Stalinia hulluksi koiraksi ja propagoittiin ja puhuttiin kuinka iso karhu uhka pientä neitoa ja kohta se viepi meiltä tilukset. Here it is in English. Uh, and, a little, and a little more uh, than what I just read. 
I was listening to the radio, and it occurred to me that the more German martial songs they played, the closer the war was getting. First, they cranked up the distrust and hate for the Russians little by little, calling Stalin a mad dog, talking about the great bear threatening the little maiden Finland, and how pretty soon they'd be taking our territory. At that point, we were all buzzing, full of ourselves, bragging about how Finland was going to be a great power in three months flat. Even peace-loving men were ready to fight. The lamb shoving itself into the wolf's mouth, as President Pasikivi said afterwards. It was the last autumn of peace, and I was playing solitaire in the office at the Inari border station when the colonel came marching up to the door, bristling with excitement. I felt pretty tickled and proud to think that this big, scary man would come all the way to Inari just because he missed me. He stood on the porch and shouted, Little poetess, we're going to Poland. And I said, Have you gone nutty? There's a war going on down there. He said he wasn't nutty. He was a professional Finnish soldier, and we were going to the Eastern Front to see how the Germans handled supply transports in occupied areas and some other things. And we'd know how to do it right once we had occupied Russian territory all the way to the Urals and put our ancestral homelands back on Finland's map. He'd heard that the Fuhrer was emptying out Warsaw and everybody who lived there was being taken to work camps all over Poland. And now the Germans were going to move in and take their place and Warsaw was going to be a German city. He'd been ordered to go there as quick as he could and he'd got permission to take his secretary with him. We boarded an unmarked Finnish military plane, and it flew us and a couple of German officers in civilian clothes across Lapland, semi-incognito. The plane made a stop in Berlin. We passed a week in the Savoy Hotel, where Greta Garbo once stayed, while we waited for Himmler's office to grant us passports and entry permits to the occupied areas. You couldn't just go there. Entry was highly restricted. We ate smoked eel and pork butt in fancy restaurants, swigged down muscat wine, strolled up and down the streets. We saw people loitering in front of half-darkened cafes, a Jew tied to a street lamp for people to spit on, shop windows filled with evening gowns made of silk, macrame, and bergamo velvet, women with half-filled shopping bags standing in line at a place that sold feather boas, street lights swinging from cables, crowded trams, wet asphalt gleaming like a misty summer lake, tenements that blossomed from the black earth, dirty streets, factories and courtyard passageways where we made love in the dark. Thank you. Thank you for your time and patience. <laughs> Thanks for taking an interest. Great to, to talk about uh, books and translations.